Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, fellow Rotarians from uh, District 5520 and elsewhere. Uh, this is uh, uh, District Governor uh, from 2015 and your foundation chair, Tom Walker, speaking to you live and in person from sunny Olathe, Kansas. And uh, this morning, uh, we're pleased to present to you uh, our annual foundation training. and. Um, uh, we have uh, three fantastic speakers. Uh, first, uh, past RI Director Brad Howard, and uh, by the way, uh, he's also aide to uh, uh, Jennifer Jones, our uh, RI President nominee, and will be speaking to us about his experiences with polio and National Immunization Days, and I am sure that you're going to uh, receive a different perspective on polio than you may have had. Uh, secondly, our, uh, our incoming uh, endowment uh, chair for Zone 26, uh, who happens to be me, uh, will be uh, talking uh, about uh, foundation giving and, and some of the uh, opportunities that you may not be aware of. And then lastly, uh, uh, past Governor Linda will be uh, dis discussing uh, District 5520's uh, uh, district or foundation program, and uh, she's filling in for me because uh, uh, I have a family commitment, which is why I'm in Olathe uh, today. So, um, uh, also, uh, I would like to ask uh, District Governor Sonny uh, to say a few words of welcome. Good morning, everyone. I'll make this really short and sweet. Thank you so much for being here. And thank you, Governor Tom, for having, for all the tireless hours of work in putting this together for us. I know, you know, as I do, that our foundation enables so much good to be done in the world, and we're looking forward to being empowered this morning. Brad Howard, we're delighted to have you with us. On behalf of District 5520, welcome everyone. And uh, now uh, it's my pleasure to introduce um, a, a gentleman that I have known for uh, several years, uh, Brad Howard. Uh, he was RI director in, uh, from the West Coast in uh, 2015 uh, through 17. I first met him uh, in January of uh, 19, or, uh, 19, uh, 2015 uh, at a presidential membership summit that was being held in Albuquerque. And I had the pleasure of uh, talking uh, with him on the way to and from the airport. And uh, so to my surprise, uh, a couple of weeks later at International Assembly, um, which for the uninitiated is governor's school. It's kind of like pets, uh, except for governors. And on the stage during Foundation Day, uh, Director uh, Brad and his daughter held a remarkable dialogue about polio and other things. So it is my pleasure to present to you um, uh, past RI Director uh, Brad Howard and uh, our aide to uh, uh, Jennifer Jones, our president nominee. Brad, thank you very much for being with us. Well, thank you. Thank you for the invitation, Governor Sonny. Thank you for having me here, um, past Governor Tom and past Governor Linda for your help in getting me set up and to ask me to be a part of this event. Um, and thank you, Tom, for remembering my daughter. In fact, one of the reasons I'm rushing is my wife is chair of the uh, end Alzheimer's effort here in the Bay Area. So today is the Alzheimer's walk. And just on the other side of my computer monitor, we're setting up a garden because it's a virtual walk. And so my daughter's out in the garden planting these memorial flowers for uh, the effort you know, that we're going to be putting on here in Oakland. So uh, anyway, George, it's also nice to know that you're in the San Francisco Bay Area. I didn't know that you were so close. Uh, nice to meet you, George. Anyway, uh, thank you for having me here. I appreciate being a part and being able to share a story with you um, of a remarkable set of events that I think have changed the world. Um, and in doing so, I believe has fundamentally changed Rotary and our members. You know, while Rotary has been eradicating polio and changing the way children are immunized globally, 
our efforts have actually created unintended consequences. Now, while we thought we were improving the lives of children so that they wouldn't get the disease, this process actually turned itself on us. It changed Rotary, it changed our districts, it changed our clubs, but from my perspective, it's changed our members. Our effort has altered what we believe that we can do as members of Rotary. It's elevated our eyes to see the possibilities of making dreams real. It's allowed us to make lasting change around the world, in our communities, and in ourselves. In January, shortly before COVID-19 consumed our planet, 50 people from all over the US and Canada climbed on an airplane to participate in India's National Polio Immunization Days. As the trip unfolded, one of the members of the group, who is both a videographer and a storyteller, started to record the images of our shared experience. And what you're about to see is a result of his talent, his observations, and his passion. Now, if you will allow me, sit back, enjoy your flight. You're about to travel to Delhi, India, to see what it's like to be on the front line of our war on polio and what our mission has meant around the world in our communities and in ourselves. Jesse, if you go ahead and start the video. My name is Brad Howard. I professionally am a, both a tour operator. We take people overseas for purpose, um, professional groups and associations. And uh, I also have commercial real estate here in the East Bay. In Rotary, I have been involved with it for about 35 years and have been a governor, which is a regional responsibility, and then been a member of the board of directors of Rotary International, the international board. So polio was a disease that was a huge issue in the early 1950s. They, towards the end of the 1950s, early 1960s, they found, they found a vaccine. Well, about that time, um, Rotary, by accident, decided that it was a very localized effort in the Philippines, that they could, if they had enough money, could buy enough vaccines to immunize all their kids. Well, they did it. And so Rotary as an organization said, wow, if all we need to do is get vaccines to kids, we could do that. And so since that time, we have been knocking off all these countries. 125 countries had polio when we started. Right now, it's down to two, Pakistan and Afghanistan. But because Pakistan and Afghanistan um, have very limited healthcare systems and border controls, it isn't limited to those countries. People are traveling across borders between those two countries, and Pakistan's a neighbor with India. When we immunize a child during these National Immunization Days, we are trying to immunize every single child in that country that are five years and younger. And this is what we did on this recent trip. Over a five-day period, they're trying to immunize more than 100 million children. Yeah. 
Okay, who's next? Oh, are you laughing at me? Are you laughing at me? Are you Whenever you walk through these villages, there's a whole pack of kids that are following you. And some of them are in areas that basically they're dumps. I mean, literally are a dump. You're watching kids play with bicycle wheels that are broken. The thing that always strikes me is how happy they are. And, and it's those smiles and it's those interactions with those, those people, the people in need, that really, I think, drive emotion for a lot of people when they're in this environment to say, I gotta help them do something. And I think that's where Rotary's job becomes um, most important. The community in which we were in was called Maywat, and Maywat is a largely Muslim populated uh, place, um, but very impoverished. In fact, the largest industry, if you will, is making fuel, fuel for fires so that they can cook and heat their house, and that fuel is quite literally made out of cow patties. This is the kitchen. This is the kitchen? I was just told that. Yeah, that's where they, that's where they, they build the fire, they cook over the fire, and this is the kitchen right here. Yeah, the, yeah, the man just told me the fiber just and there's what's called the caste system. And so there's this whole spectrum of haves and have nots. There are those that are called the untouchables. And in society, they really don't have a place. One of the parts of the polio eradication effort is one day you go from door to door looking for kids in each house to know that everyone's been immunized. The ability to see what happens with polio comes in two parts. One, the emotion of, I'm going to stop this from happening to another kid. But the second part is helping those that didn't have the two drops and those people who now cannot walk. Well, there is a hospital in Delhi that many years ago, um, some of the Rotarians in the Bay Area came together and, and in concert and partnership with Rotarians in Delhi, helped fund a post-polio ward. Uh, a gentleman by the name of Dr. Matthews is the key surgeon that literally performs miracles on these people. These are people whose feet are sideways. They can only crawl on their hands and knees and yet he's able to turn those lives into an upright life. There's a place in Jaipur called the Jaipur Foot Factory that is supported in part by Rotary and in part by others that quite literally takes the PVC pipes that we all know that go in the ground that, that carry sewage and water and is able to turn them into a limb that can be put on a leg so that people quite literally can walk in day one and on day two be walking with a new prosthetic limb. What is it called?
Your name is? Kushi. My name is Josh. Hello, may I uh, identify as you wish? I can open the shop. So this Rotary Club has been dedicated to help elevate the resources and training of the teachers. And to give you a picture of the school, they've built a great building, small, there's two parts. One is for young children, and the other one is a vocational training school for the women of the village to learn how to sew and therefore be productive for themselves. But this school is quite literally in the middle of a pigsty, and no one wants to walk anywhere near where the pigs are hanging out. You can imagine if you're in a village that's called a slum, the effect of having 50 people from another country come into your presence, bring you stuff and resources, and buy your goods, how that inspires them that they are better than what they have. I really didn't know what to expect coming to India. Um, we, my wife and I, uh, are both Rotarians, and we came knowing that we were coming for a good cause. And um, we have definitely fulfilled our mission in that, in seeing um, lives changed, uh, putting two drops of, of uh, polio vaccination into a small child's mouth, knowing that that child will not suffer the consequences of a debilitating, deathly um, sickness called polio. When I first did this trip, I contemplated doing it. I thought to myself, you know, is this really uh, just a self-satisfying thing about going over here? Wouldn't that money that I spent on this coming over here be better spent if I were to donate it to the Polio Plus campaign. And the Rotarians here put it another way. They said that our coming here is inspiring to them that we would do that. I think every Rotarian should have an opportunity to give a child two magic drops and to see the great work that's being done in this country to help not only prevent polio, but to help those that are still suffering from the effects. Uh, it's just, it would be very worthwhile to participate in. Probably the most inspirational trip I've ever gone on, and I've traveled quite a bit, but this trip, you can't compare it to other trips because you know you're doing something good, but at the same time, you're showing, you know, this is America, you're a foreigner, but we're all the same. We all have that feeling of we want to help each other. I think that you can see a lot of really wonderful, lovely things amongst the dirty air and the dirty living conditions. And um, I spent a lot of time with kids and trying to communicate through language barriers. And there's just, there's love there. It's lovely. Coming to India has just been an absolute blessing uh, to see the amount of work that goes into this national um, inoculation day. Uh, the entire country inoculates their children. It's just, it's amazing. It's encouraging that even though we don't speak the language down here, everybody's been warm, warm to us, receptive. So, you know, the, it, it gives me encouragement when I go home that, you know, we can use this as a model so that we're not divided. We can unite around a common purpose which is to take care of people. Well, we started, when we started our effort, there were 350,000 new cases annually of polio. This past year, there was about 140 cases, and that's significant. But the real difference is, why are we here on Earth? What is our legacy? And watching people take these trips, I think, helps to define that. You can't help but feel, for just random luck, I was born there and got all this good stuff for that. I could have been born here and been needing other people's help. And when you have a chance to see it and believe that you can do something about it, it makes a huge difference. Um, so what's the future of polio? It'll be gone. 
What will happen next? Well, that's up to the Rotarians, and it will be up to them to decide where their passion is, where their future is, and how they can, through the effort of making friends with others, create lasting change across the globe, in their community, and in their selves. Well, I hope you all enjoyed your trip to India and the story that unfolded. Um, this was done very organically. It was being recorded by this one young man, and we all thought it was just going to be sort of a, a memory piece for us to keep from the trip. And yet he produced a story that I thought really is very telling and very accurate of the experience that people have when they're able to participate in the eradication of polio. I, I wanna share a little bit more of a broader perspective though about the eradication of polio and the observations that I have made about its effect. Now, as the story told, and as I'm sure all of you are perhaps extremely aware, we go from 350,000 new cases every year in 19, the mid 1980s and decided that if we could raise enough money, we could buy enough vaccines and it would be distributed and all the kids of the world would be polio free. So in 87, 88, we were told that if you raise $110 million, you will be able to buy enough vaccines and your job will be done. We didn't raise 110, we raised 247,000, excuse me, 247 million dollars to eradicate this disease. The first time we'd ever been able to raise that amount of money in one year. And at the Philadelphia Convention, I was lucky enough to be there. I was actually club president that year. And we stood there on the floor of the convention. The amount of money was announced and balloons rained down on our head. We were shaking hands saying, we did it, we're done. We were incredibly naive. We thought we were done, we were just starting. We realized that in order to achieve our goal, we would have to create partnerships. So Rotary reached out in 1988, based on the fact that we raised almost a quarter of a billion dollars, Un uh, the World Health Organization made it a high priority to eradicate polio. They'd attempted to do it in the past, but didn't believe it was possible. But now with us, with our global presence, and with our money, gave them new hope. And so the World Health Organization, the Centers for Disease Control, and UNICEF, became our partners. And later, as you know, the governments of the world joined us and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation most recently. But it was well beyond just creating partnerships and raising money. We needed to create the technical and mechanical infrastructure in order to be able to do the job, to create laboratories throughout the globe. Many of those laboratories were used in the Ebola crisis of 2014 and now during the COVID crisis. Further than that, we had to create what's called a cold chain. The cold chain is the way that we can take the vaccine from the time it's manufactured and keep it at near freezing from that moment until the two drops hit, hits the mouth of a child. And while that sounds pretty easy in our environment, it is not easy when you have to get on a boat to go up a river or go through a forest to get to a child. And so we had to create something that had never been created before. But what's interesting is when you go out in the field, those boxes you saw, those that the little coolers that keep our vaccine cold, when you pull the lid off and you look inside, it's not just the vaccine for polio, it's vitamin A, it's measles. There's all these other vaccines that piggyback on our structure that we put into place. And therefore it was called polio plus. And fundamentally, it changed the way that kids throughout the world were being vaccinated. It used to be in the 1990s and early 2000s, when we'd go into a village, they would have a tally sheet to determine how many kids had been vaccinated. And they'd compare that against what they thought was the population of children five and younger. And that's how they proceeded to determine that they'd been successful. Where now, when you go into that village of Maywat, they have a book, every child has a book that's ticked off. And that was not there, it was created because of the need to ensure that we had been immunizing the children. 
Rotary drove that. But even beyond what our infrastructure did, the success in health uh, initiatives for governments, I learned a valuable lesson. Back about 2005, I took a group to Cote d'Ivoire, to the Ivory Coast, and we were in the capital city of Abidjan, about to go out to do our polio immunizations. And as we were waiting in the lobby of a hotel for our local hosts, the Rotarians, to pick us up, to take us to the various places, I looked over and I could see a white woman, short white woman, wearing a collar. She was a cleric, and very clearly, she was American. So having some time, I walked over wearing my rotary shirt and introduced myself and I said, what are you doing here? She said, well, I'm with the United Methodist Church of Texas. Wow, okay. And what are you doing here? She said, well, we're going to distribute mosquito bed nets to mothers and very young children to prevent malaria. Huh, you said we, but I only see you. She said, yes, I'm picking up 23 people from the airport tonight to do the job. Oh, okay. So how long are you going to be here? 10 days. Great, great. So how many mosquito bed nets are you going to distribute? 800,000. 800,000. I was as stunned as you are by that number. And I said, how do you think that 23 people over 10 days are going to distribute 800,000 bed nets? And she reached over and grabbed my shirt where my rotary wheel was on my, shoulder, on my sleeve. And she said to me, we just saw what you did and we're copying you. We not only were immunizing children throughout the world, we were empowering other organizations to have dreams too, to believe that if we could do it, they could do it. And fundamentally started to change the way that healthcare is being provided all over the world. But as impressive as everything that I've talked about is, I don't think that it's the most profound element of what we have done. See, I think what that is, is that this whole process has encouraged our Rotarians to leave the comfort of their weekly meetings, to go to places that they never knew they would go to, to do things they never imagined. To look into the eyes of a child whose life you're changing? I'm not a doctor, but I've had that experience. But it's even beyond that. What's truly remarkable was not the effect of polio immunizations on these people, it was observing the conditions in which they lived and responding to it just like any human would. Putting those two drops in someone's mouth is remarkable, but it's not the best part. I've seen the best part because the best part comes out of the people that come over to give out those two drops. They'll be in this village and they'll give out the two drops, but then they'll look up and they'll realize they're in the center of town and they'll see this creek going through the center of town, but they'll realize, wait, that's not fresh water, that's sewage. Or they'll go into a school and they'll see four kids sitting at a desk all together with each with a piece of paper in front of them. But only one child is writing with a pencil. And you're thinking, what am I looking at? Why is this the case? And you suddenly realize what is going on when that first child hands that pencil to the second child to do their work. And you think, oh my God, for lack of a pencil, you can't do your work? I will make sure I get you pencils. I will get you a case of pencils. I will do something that will ensure you never lack education for lack of supplies. Or you go back out into that village and you see that creek and you say, I don't know anything about water and sanitation, but Rotary does. Rotary has that information. I will go back and I will find a way to get this village fresh water. They come back, they plug into our Rotary Foundation. Part of it's the money, but I don't think that's the best part. The best part is that it allows us to believe we could do something like that that we have resources. Yes, money's a part, but it's expertise, it's connectivity, it's people like you that can help other people realize the dreams of our foundation. Most of the time we talk about our foundation as if it's a repository for money. No, it's an incubator of dreams, of the ability to enable our members to do something that they could never do on their own. 
Think about it. Because of that, our members have the ability to prevent disease or affect maternal and child health or believe that they can absolutely go into a village and change their sanitation and give them clean water. And maybe not one village, maybe 10 villages. Or now they can help, now that these villages can have people that are without disease and with clean water and proper sanitation, we need to educate them. We need to give them the ability to raise themselves up, to transform schools from a place that just hold children to a place of their future or to provide economic and community development projects that allow people to live better, better educated lives and produce for their families, produce for their village. And if we do all that, Rotary believes, and we do, actually move the needle on peace. What's always extraordinary to me is how much we believe that we create peaceful communities. And not in an abstract way, but in a concrete way, in an incremental way to make our lives better and those around us better. And if ever we need a more peaceful planet, it's now. It's right now. Rotary Foundation is one of the best benefits of membership in our organization. It's an enabler of dreams. It allows people to be better than they could be on their own. And it changes our purpose here. Now, Rotary is eradicating polio. But its legacy may be more in how we changed our organization, how we changed global healthcare, and our clubs, and most importantly, our individual Rotarians. We gave them the ability to dream and the tools to enable those dreams to become reality. And you, the people that show up here on a Saturday morning to participate in an event like this, are the ones that lead them to those dreams. When you talk about the foundation, don't just talk about money. Help the Rotarians to understand the possibilities they have in front of them. And once they do that, once their passion is ignited, they'll do good in the world. So thank you very much for letting me come and share my, my observations and my deep belief of the purpose of our Rotary Foundation in its effort to eradicate polio. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Brad, thank you very much for uh, making time for us today. Uh, I wonder if uh, you have time for a couple of questions. Absolutely. So, Linda, I think you were going to moderate this. Uh, unmute yourself. I'm sorry. I was a little slow at the thing. All right. I was answering a question I, um, that was already brought before us. Yale, in answer to your question, we are taping um, this entire section. So yes, Brad's um, speech will be provided for you in untaped form. I, that's what I was answering at the time. I do apologize. If you have any questions for Brad, please uh, put them in chat form and um, unmute or you can unmute yourself and bring it forward. Uh, Brad, if if I may, uh, what about upcoming immunization days? I guess I, uh, naively I thought that the, uh, that they were a thing of the past, uh, other than in the uh, uh, two countries. Uh, no, they're not. Well, broadly, they are still doing immunizations, mass immunizations um, globally. What the entire objective of the polio eradication effort is to work with the health departments, the, the government health departments, to raise the routine immunization levels so that like we did, when it's time for you to get vaccinated as a small child, you get the appropriate vaccines to protect yourself. Polio is one. 
But in areas where healthcare is not that solid or the government doesn't have the funds to do it, they have to saturate the population in order to raise those immunization levels to get to what we now understand as herd immunity, to a sufficiently high level that everybody's immunized, that even if there is a little bit of an outbreak, it doesn't really, or one or two people have it, it doesn't spread. In many areas, they have to go in and oversaturate the population because the routine immunization levels are low. So India has been without polio for, oh my gosh, I want to say about seven years now. But they still do what they call mop-up immunizations. That's what we did in Maywat because that's an area at risk that, in fact, they need to raise the immunization levels to a higher place. When we first started going into Maywat about 10 years ago, it was, they were only about 20% immunized. Now it's about 80%, still not at the highest level that they want. 80% normally is just about the marginal level that you want to be at, you'd like to be higher. So even in Africa, which now has been certified as polio-free, they are doing these immunizations. Now, not all of them are doing national immunization days, what are called NIDs, NIDs. They're not because they have taken care of, or they have eradicated polio of the, the wild polio virus at least. And so they will just do specific areas. Now, Pakistan, Afghanistan are still doing national immunization days. India, because of its proximity, is still doing national immunization days. So these trips um, that we do, we will continue to do uh, once we can travel again. Uh, I would, I've been taking groups into Africa and uh, India for 23 years now. Um, and we will continue to do it until the disease is gone. But uh, we had to stop. Governments all over the world stopped doing immunizations in March with the uh, onset of COVID. It picked back up in June, July, and yes, there's been challenges as a result of it, but we are back on track. And, and while, you know, a couple of years ago, we were down in just the double digits, we're back up in the triple digits. It's only about 170 uh, so far this year. So we're fortunate that it hasn't exploded beyond that, but we're very conscious of our future. So I think I gave you a much longer answer than, you, than the question, but hopefully I answered what you asked. Thank you very much. Thank you, past district governor. Um, <laughs> that is terrible. You, Maureen, no, David. <laughs> um, yes, we have a chat question from Brenda Wal uh, Waters. Is, are I considering adult MMR vaccinations in the U.S. COVID-19? Um, let's put it this way. I can't say definitively because I haven't been at the table to make that decision, but I do know that Rotary is engaging with the World Health Organization, with our government, um, to use two elements that we have at our disposal. First is our polio. Um, I could show you a video and give you a whole different presentation on what Rotary is doing about COVID and how uh, our structure that's been around polio is being used. Um, so that's number one, is that we are in that process of conversation. Um, number two is that there's actually a Rotary Action Group that is focused on family health days that bring, goes into places of the world and does immunizations and provides health care. When I say goes into a place, 100,000 people over two days will come in and get serviced. So the key, and this is what we've learned out of polio, while it will be essential to do it within the US. We are perhaps better suited, hopefully better suited to distribute vaccines, assuming that everyone takes the vaccine. But the real key is not just covering the United States, it's covering the world because if we can't solve it overseas, it will come back. So Rotary is in the process of trying to be a key player to provide our resources, our infrastructure, and our global presence and advocacy to play a role. How that role will play? Well, we need to get a vaccine first and then figure out how we can be of best service. So within the United States, I'm not exactly sure because there are many other factors we have to deal with, but we do work very carefully with our government and they know us well. The US government provides about a quarter of billion dollars every year to the polio eradication effort. They know us 
and they know that we are a resource that they can use. Okay, thank you, Brad. Any additional questions? Yes, I have one, Linda. Okay. Brad, I, I'm totally amazed at your, your uh, program that you have, that taking all these people. How many teams of uh, Rotarians go over to a country to, to eradicate uh, or immunize kids? Well, it, it varies. Um, a lot of these countries had to consolidate these teams because you can imagine, I'm bringing over 50 people. There's a lot of activities. Not only do we participate in the National Immunization Days, we connect with the local Rotary Clubs. I try to take them into projects so that they can see the work of the foundation and the work of the local clubs. And more importantly than anything, we try to integrate with the local Rotarians so we create relationships, friendships for lasting um, efforts and connection. Uh, I know that when we go into India, there's about a half dozen teams. There's teams that come in from the Netherlands, from Japan, from Great Britain. Um, I've seen other teams that have come in from the US. Um, so we will come in, there's probably a half dozen. Um, the Anne-Lee Hussey, if you've ever heard that name, uh, just a tremendous Rotarian from Maine. She takes groups over um, and has been doing it as long as I've been doing it. And I started in 1998 taking people. Um, so there are, are and will remain teams of people that go over. Some of them are as small as about 10. Um, I've taken groups as large as 100 um, to Nigeria to participate in these, these things. Um, so we are out, it's diminishing because fortunately there's fewer places that need us. Um, and I'm a professional tour operator, so I'm well insured for what I do, but my insurance will not cover me in Pakistan and Afghanistan. So I don't know that we're gonna be going there as a large group um, for, for reasons that are, are fairly obvious. But I hope I, I answered your, your question, Jimmy. Yeah, and also, can you explain a little bit more about the Polio Plus that you just kind of briefly mentioned? Sure. Well, we realized once we built this infrastructure that if we were going out and reaching into the communities and, and getting to children five years and younger, there was far more that we could do with all those things that would typically be um, routine immunization items. And so measles has become a very big one. Um, the typical, and, and I'm not a medical professional, so I can't even articulate all that we would normally go through in our country for routine immunizations, those we were taking out and into the field. I know we were also doing uh, vitamin A for, for vision and some other elements that came in. I'll tell you the one thing that struck me um, that showed me how effective we were. One time I was walking in this village in Ghana in Accra, which is the capital of Ghana. And I was wearing a shirt with a great big rotary wheel on my chest. And as I was walking down the street, these children who could not speak English were coming by me. And as I walked by, they pointed at me and said, polio, polio. Our brand, <laughs> these kids knew our brand. And they knew that when they, that box opened and things came out of that box, it was okay to put it in your mouth or put it in your arm. The mothers knew that, the fathers knew that. And so I cannot articulate all the specific vaccines that were in there, but the effort was to get the routine immunization, those things that are essential for basic health, into that box and out into the field. Thank you, Brad. Brad, a, a follow-up question, if I could. Uh, where can we find more information on upcoming um, NIDs or upcoming uh, trips? Well, you can send me an email. Uh, Tom has my email address, uh, so does Linda. And we have a database that we put out anytime we're doing a trip. The other one is you could write Rotary, rotary.org, and ask them to give you a list of names of all those people who do that. Um, Nancy Barbie's another name, uh, Anne-Lee Hussey, um, and people like that that can help you um, plug in. I can tell you, nothing is going to happen before the middle of next year, if then, until COVID can be taken care of. People are just not willing to get on an airplane, fly for 12 hours and get into a foreign environment. And as I'm sure you're tracking, India right now is, Delhi in particular is a hot spot for the spread of COVID. So all of that's been shuttered down. So if you have a little patience, it will get back up and, and be activated. In fact, right now I should have been in Abuja, Nigeria doing the West Africa Project Fair and doing an NID program with them. 
but all that right now, all I can do is next week's our virtual West Africa Project Fair. Um, so everything is kind of halted for the time being. Uh, Brad, we want to thank you uh, again for your time. And before you uh, uh, get out with your daughter on your uh, virtual Alzheimer's walk, uh, uh, Arturo Barrio, our uh, uh, public image chair, would like you to take a uh, class photo. Um, and uh, uh, Arturo, can you do that for us? Yes, Tom, thank you. So I will ask everybody if you can uh, please activate your cameras and a big smile. Brad, we're very grateful for your time. So thanks everybody. I'm gonna take a little bit because we have great participation. So just keep smiling for, I don't know, 10 seconds. One, two, three. Let me do the following page, one second. Keep smiling, one, two, three. Awesome, thank you, Tom. Well, uh, thank you, Arturo. Uh, again, Brad, uh, most inspirational and uh, thank you. Um, because you were doing the presentation, you, you couldn't see the comments, but uh, uh, suffice it to say they were most uh, Im impressed and uh, uh, taken with your presentation. Thank you my, again. My pleasure, glad to be of service, Governor Sonny, past Governor Tom and Linda and Rotary. Thank, thank you, Brad. Thank, thank you. all you do. My and pleasure. Have a great today, have fun. All right. Bye. Yeah. Bye.